This evening we're uh, looking at uh, Matthew's Gospel, and we're continuing the theme, as you've already heard me say in the, uh, the prayer that I just uh, offered, uh, the mini-series within the series of why we believe what we believe, and really such a series is, is quite expansive because we believe a lot of things. The Bible teaches a lot of things. And we do find ourselves, um, in, in many cases, in agreement with, with other churches but uh, certainly there are those areas where we disagree and perhaps the um, historic church that we may disagree with the most would be the Roman church, which is why there was a Protestant Reformation, why there was a Martin Luther, uh, why we have Protestants and uh, Catholics today. But what I'd like to do is uh, look this evening at the particular issue of how the Roman church believes that sins are forgiven uh, versus what we believe as far as what the Bible teaches. Now, it has to do with the keys of the kingdom, and that's what we're going to be looking at this evening. What are those keys, and how are they exercised? What is the power that Christ has given to his church uh, to bind and to loose? That's what we want to consider as we, as we look at this particular text. And what I'd like to do is read Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 13 through verse 20. But we are going to focus, I think you'll notice as I read through this, we're going to focus specifically on verse 19. Well, this is what we read. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening as we consider again what, uh, what Jesus is referring to here by the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And it has to do, of course, with the forgiveness of sins. Now we have, as, as we've seen so far in this uh, mini-series, that the, well, the Roman church divided our offenses against God into two different areas. When we sin, we incur uh, not only guilt, but also punishment for the things we've done. And what we've seen so far that they teach, that the idea that we have to satisfy for that punishment that is due for our sins after death, that is after we die, or that we have to be purified from any imperfections in a place called purgatory, that the church has the authority to dispense indulgences that can lessen your time in purgatory or actually uh, mitigate your time there altogether uh, because they have access to a treasury of merits uh, in heaven, which are the leftover works, you might say, works of piety of Jesus Christ and of Mary and of the saints or that of our works or the works of others that those can in any way satisfy for the punishment that is due for our sins, all of these things are foreign to the Bible. You will not find these things there because that's not what it teaches. Now, this kind of teaching, in fact, binds us to an organization for our ultimate entrance into heaven. We don't come straight to Jesus Christ to enter into heaven, but rather... There is this institution called the church with the priesthood with the ability to open up this treasury of merits to spare us, as it were, this time in purgatory. We have to come through them, as it were, rather than to Jesus Christ alone. Now, from what we've seen already, it's no wonder that Martin Luther reacted as he did against the church's teaching of his day because he believed that we can come straight to Christ and enter straight into heaven. But I do want to remind you again that what we've looked at so far is only really one half of the equation. When we sin, as we've already seen, we do become liable to punishment. 
Uh, the church at that time believed in purgatory, merits, indulgences. That was the way that the church had to deal with this punishment rather than the work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. We've seen that Jesus, when he died on the cross and through his sufferings, made a complete satisfaction for our sins. We don't have to make it up after we die. Jesus did it through his death. But the question we want to look at this evening is the other part. What about our guilt? Now, the Church of Luther's day and the Roman Church of today, they have a way of dealing with this that is, again, tied to the church rather than to Jesus Christ. Although they would credit Jesus Christ with the ultimate forgiveness of sins, this is not something we do. It's not something, well, I mean, be guarded about this, that Mary does. It's not something the saints do, but rather it's something Jesus Christ does alone. However, it is mediated through particular things. In, well, in, in this case, the sacrament of baptism and penance. And this is what they understand to be the keys of the kingdom of God, the means by which what Jesus Christ has done is actually applied to us. It's not by grace through faith alone, but it's through baptism and penance. Now again, let me just remind you that we're not examining Rome's beliefs simply to knock the Roman church. That's not what we're trying to do. Uh, the way that the church has come to learn truth over the years is, with, is in this backdrop of, of teaching that enters into the church, which is true. I mean, why do we have uh, the confessions that we have today? Although if you look at many churches, you'll see their confessions are basically one page long and they, they hit the key points. We might say those are, those are fundamental, those are foundational, they're important. But the church believes a lot more than just what's on that one page. And how has the church come to uh, believe those things and to embrace those things? Well, it's because, it's not, it's not always because the church simply went into the scriptures to see what it taught, but it was because somebody came up with an idea that began to circulate in the church, and then after it's there for a little while, the church begins to think about it and see, they go to the scriptures to see whether or not it's true, and then if they decide that it is, they will embrace it. If they decide it isn't, they'll formulate what they believe to be the truth as over against what is being taught. That's basically how creeds and confessions are formed. Now, we're bringing up what Rome believes as an example of a particular error so that by comparing it with the scriptures, we may understand the truth more clearly. And at the same time, we're gaining a better understanding of what it is that Luther had to deal with during the time of the Reformation, why he stood out, why he put his life on the line, why he was willing to be declared an outlaw, why he was willing even to die. It's because he believed that what the church was teaching wasn't true and could lead people ultimately to hell. So this evening, I want us to consider in this regard, first of all, what the Church of Rome believes regarding the use of the keys of the kingdom for forgiveness. How is a person forgiven of their guilt? Again, is over against the punishment. We've looked at punishment, now we're looking at guilt. And then secondly, what it is we believe the Bible teaches with regard to the keys and the forgiveness of sins. So first of all, then, what does the Roman church believe? What does the Roman church teach regarding how our sins are forgiven? Now, in the Catholic Catechism, the official document of the Roman church, in an exposition of the Apostles' Creed, we read these couple of, of quotes that gives to us at least the beginning of what we're going to be looking at. This is what they say, quote, The Apostles' Creed associates faith in the forgiveness of sins, not only with faith in the Holy Spirit, but also with faith in the church and in the communion of saints. Now, tune in here because this is the important part. It was when he, that is Jesus, gave the Holy Spirit to his apostles that the risen Christ conferred on them his own divine power to forgive sins. I hope you see what, what's being said here. It's, pretty, it's a pretty heavy statement. Jesus gave them the power to forgive sins. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. 
Now that is a quote from scripture. We're going to have to deal with that. What does that mean? Does that mean Jesus gave his apostles the power to forgive sins? Now, the second question arises, granted that Jesus gave the, the power to forgive sins to his church, how are these sins forgiven? Well, this is what the second quote deals with. Our Lord tied the forgiveness of sins to faith and baptism. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Baptism is the first and chief sacrament of forgiveness of sins because it unites us with Christ who died for our sins and rose for our justification so that we too might walk in newness of life. Now I want you to, to see from these two statements, it's clear that Rome, now again, I'm talking about the church. What is the official teaching of the church? I'm not talking about necessarily what those who are in that church believe. This is what the church believes and teaches. You know, people who are in churches don't necessarily believe what churches teach, so there may be some disconnect there. But from these two statements, it's clear that Rome believes Jesus gave the apostles his power to forgive sins. By the way, they believe that was transferred on to the priests in succession from Peter through apostolic succession. He gave them this power and this authority when he gave them the Holy Spirit. And the primary way they believe Jesus teach, taught, or basically that, that sins are forgiven, is through the sacrament of baptism which in their view unites us to Jesus Christ. Water baptism unites us to Christ. Now, we could spend a lot of time in the Catholic Catechism, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time just summarizing what they say from there and then conclude with some brief statements that they make that tell us that this is plainly what they do believe. They believe, first of all, when we profess faith in Christ that we are to be baptized. When we are baptized, we are completely forgiven now, in this case, of actual sins, sins we commit, of original sin, I believe the sin of Adam is how they understand that. All the guilt th that we have incurred is absolutely removed and any liability to punishment, okay? Baptism takes care of guilt, takes care of punishment. Everything is taken care of in one package. Now, if you were to die at the moment that you were baptized, you would pass by purgatory and go straight to heaven, which is why many believers in the ancient church, in the church in those days, would put baptism off until the very last possible moment of their lives so they could get this free pass to heaven, get all their sins and all the punishment dealt with at one time. And, you know, if you believe this, this is what you would do, isn't it? I mean, that would be the wise thing to do. Uh, so, again, the very last moment possible, so they spend the least amount of time in purgatory. Now, there is a problem, though, and that is that most people don't actually get baptized at the end of their lives. They actually get baptized sooner than that. And people still sin after they're baptized, so they incur more guilt, and they are liable to more punishment. They believe that we have an inherent weakness that is called concupiscence, basically a fleshly appetite that will work within our hearts to give rise to other sins. By the way, they believe that that concupiscence, I believe, existed also in Adam in the garden. Now, that's something that's a part of our nature. Now, we believe this fleshly appetite is a real thing and we believe that Christians have to deal with it. You know, all who are truly saved still have that corruption in their hearts. But we do believe it is the result of sin, and that's not the way we were created. We call that original sin. And that is more serious in our thinking than in theirs, because we believe original sin completely takes away our ability to trust in Jesus Christ by our own strength. That's the reason why Paul says that if... Well, as we come into the world, there is no one who does good, not even one. Jesus says those who are in the flesh cannot please God. If, you, if that's all you have, if, if all you have is what you brought into this world apart from the grace of God, you're not able to do that. Now, they don't believe that. They believe that it hinders us, it causes sin, but it still doesn't incapacitate us 
from being able to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, to repent and to turn, on, uh, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ on our own. But now let's just get back to this. They believe in fleshly appetites after baptism. So what happens? Well, because we still have these fleshly appetites, because we still have desires for sin, we sin. And because we sin, there's guilt, there's punishment. Now, we've already seen how they deal with punishment. That's through indulgences and merits and, and good works and so forth. But what about guilt? How do we deal with guilt after baptism? Well, they believe the way you deal with it is penance. And this is where we come back again to the catechism for a few more quotes. First of all, they, they say this. If the church has the power to forgive sins, then baptism cannot be her only means of using the keys of the kingdom of heaven received from Jesus Christ. The church must be able to forgive all penitents their offenses, even if they should sin until the last moment of their lives. It is through the sacrament of penance that the baptized can be reconciled with God and with the church. This sacrament of penance is necessary for salvation for those who have fallen after baptism, just as baptism is necessary for those who have not yet been reborn. The church has received the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which they, well, which they believe to be exercised through these two things, baptism and penance, so that in her, in the church, sins may be forgiven through Christ's blood and the Holy Spirit's action. Now, they do believe that you need Christ's blood, you need the atonement, but it's mediated through the church, through baptism and penance. In this church, the soul dead through sin comes back to life in order to live with Christ, whose grace has saved us. They believe in salvation by grace alone. The Roman church believes that, but they don't believe it's by faith alone. They believe it is through these various sacraments. Now, they also believe that there is no offense too great that the church cannot forgive. Now, that's an interesting statement too, isn't it? Because we do know in Scripture there is a sin that has no forgiveness. And that is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which, again, we won't get into right now. You've heard me speak on what, what that is. Now, they also go on to say this. Priests have received from God a power that he has given neither to angels nor to archangels. God above confirms what priests do here below. Were there no forgiveness of sins in the church, there would be no hope of life to come or eternal liberation. Let us thank God who has given his church such a gift. Well, I think we would agree with them. If that was the only way a person could be forgiven, if that was given to the church, we would certainly praise God for that. But that is not what the Bible teaches now, let's just summarize what we've seen up to this point, and then we'll move into what we believe the Bible teaches. First of all, Rome believes Jesus gave the apostles the power to forgive sins when he gave them the Holy Spirit. They believe, quote, baptism is the, is the first and chief sacrament of the forgiveness of sins. It unites us to Christ who died and rose and gives us his Holy Spirit. Again, quote, by Christ's will, the church possesses the power to forgive the sins of the baptized and exercises it through bishops and priests normally in the sacrament of penance. Now, this is their view of the keys of the kingdom. Basically, the kingdom of heaven is open to us through baptism, which brings about the new birth in their view. And then when you kill that sin in you or that, that grace in you and and you become dead again, then you need penance to become alive again and ultimately make it to heaven. By the way, they don't believe every sin kills you. Mortal sins kill you. Venial sins just make the grace leak out of your vessel, as it were, so that you have to spend more time in purgatory. But these are the keys, baptism and penance. Now, what do we believe the Bible teaches we are going to set aside the issues of baptism and penance right now as far as what we believe is over against what they believe. But instead, what I want us to focus on is the exercise of the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is the question I want us to consider. Does the Lord mean to tell us in his word that whatever his ministers do on earth basically is going to be confirmed in heaven? 
whatever his ministers forgive on earth will be forgiven by heaven? Or is it basically the other way around? Well, we believe it's the other way around. And what I mean by that is this. Ministers declare on earth that sins are forgiven on the basis of what the Lord says is true in heaven if certain conditions are met. Now let's consider just briefly what the three verses are in Scripture that deals with the keys, and then we'll try to understand what it means. First of all, our text, Matthew 16, verse 19. Jesus says to Peter, and by the way, this first passage is, is spoken to Peter specifically, and we're not really dealing with this issue this evening, but uh, on the basis of this, the Roman church believes that these are the keys given to Peter as the first pope because they were given to Peter alone. And yet, in the second passage I'm going to read, Jesus says the same thing to his apostles as a whole which means it wasn't just for Peter, but this is something he was entrusting to the church, and we want to find out what that is. So first of all, Matthew 16, 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Matthew 18, 18, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Notice the similarity of language, almost identical. But here he's speaking to the apostles. And then in John 20, verse 23, which is the text the catechism quoted as the basis for this power of forgiveness given to the church. And uh, in, in some translations of the Bible, uh, you can understand, such as the one that I had already read from them, you can understand how they might get that impression. I mean, maybe you got that impression as I read it, but listen to what it says here, and there, there's addition, an additional word here to pay attention to. We're going to come back to look at it. He says, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Now, what do these passages mean? Well, we believe, first of all, that what Jesus, is, the thrust of what he's saying here is this, that he is entrusting to his apostles the gospel ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. Because let's break down what, what, what he's talking about here. What is the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is talking about? What is this kingdom that that uh, he says on another occasion, violent men are pressing forward to get in, trying to uh, storm, as it were, the kingdom of heaven. What is it that are after when he says, strive that you may enter in the narrow gate? What is he referring to here? Well, I think he's referring to eternal life. He's referring to salvation. That's what is in the kingdom of heaven. To be outside is to be lost. To be in the kingdom of heaven is to be saved. So the kingdom of heaven is referring to forgiveness of sins. It is referring to salvation. It is referring to the entrance into eternal life in heaven. Well, what about the keys that are referred to here, which uh, presumably unlock the kingdom of heaven because they are the keys to the kingdom? What could the key to the kingdom of heaven possibly be? Is it baptism and penance? Is that what Jesus Christ taught us? No, the only key to the kingdom of heaven is the gospel, which is the work of Jesus Christ, the message of what Jesus has done to save sinners, which is more than just a message. It's actually something that happened, something he really did, and something that if you trust in, you will be saved. It is the message of faith and repentance. Remember what Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel... For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. What is the key to the kingdom of heaven? Well, it can only be the gospel. That's all the Lord gave to us, the message of what Jesus Christ has done. And any man, woman, or child who repents of their sins and trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ is forgiven. The kingdom of heaven opens to them and they enter into the kingdom of heaven. The church doesn't forgive these sins. Jesus Christ does directly through faith in his name. Now, I believe here Jesus is first giving his apostles the key of the gospel when he says, I'm giving to you the, king, the, the keys of the kingdom. 
so that by preaching the gospel, they might open the, the doors of the kingdom to as many as believe. Now, I do think there's another sense in which the Lord is entrusting the keys of the kingdom to the apostles, and this is one that um, seems to be almost virtually unknown in the church today, but something that you know by now that we practice. Because the kingdom of heaven doesn't refer only to the invisible kingdom of God, that which belongs only to those who truly, savingly believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It also refers to the visible kingdom of God, which is the church, what we call the visible church. Now, the key to that kingdom is exactly the same key that opens up the eternal kingdom. It is the gospel. And I think in this sense, Jesus was entrusting his apostles with the authority to admit members to the church on the basis of their profession of faith or their trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ or to exclude them or remove them on the basis of their unrepentant sin. I mean, what we're talking about here is people come into the church through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They trust in Jesus Christ. They're admitted into the membership. But then on certain occasions, they may be not admitted because they really don't know the truth or they really don't have a life that's consistent with one who believes in, in Jesus Christ. Or maybe they come into the church and then they show that they don't believe or they begin committing some serious sin that requires that they be removed from the church. What we're talking about here is coming in and going out of the visible kingdom of heaven or the, the church. Now again, they don't have the power. The, the apostles are not, are not forgiving and they're not uh, retaining, as it were, sins in this case, but they're declaring on the basis of that individual's profession of the true faith. Uh, because they have believed the gospel, because they have trusted in Jesus, because they're turning from their sins, because they are following him, because the evidence is there, they are saying, as far as we can see, you are a true believer, and so you are to be admitted to the church. Or, of course, to declare that they're not forgiven on the evidence that, or actually on the lack of evidence, that they are true believers. And by the way, that's, that's what historically the elders of the church have, have done in admitting members to a church, is they, they examine you for membership. That's, that's what we do in this church. We examine you to see if you understand the gospel. We examine you to see if, if you are, in fact, at least believing yourself to be a Christian and confessing that you're living the kind of life that is consistent with that profession. In other words, you're repenting of your sins and you're following after the Lord Jesus. If you're doing that, then you're welcome to come into the membership of the church and all the benefits and privileges of the church. But if you're living an ungodly life, then you may not come in. Or if you come in and begin to live an ungodly life, the Lord tells us that that needs to be dealt with through various means of discipline, one of which is excommunication. And that person would be put out of the church in the hopes and in, in the prayers that they might repent and be brought back into the church. I mean, how can you put someone out of the church if they're never in the church in the first place? There has to be a way to admit them and there has to be a way for them to leave. That is the exercise of these keys. And this is to the visible kingdom, not the invisible. No elder really has, has well, they, they can, I suppose, to a certain degree say, well, it's possible that you're not a Christian. It's possible that you are a Christian. They don't know for sure. And so they can't say with any kind of certainty, this is your state. So again, it's not admitting or, or removing, as it were, from the invisible kingdom, from your traveling to heaven, from the fact that you're going to arrive there. But it has to do with the visible kingdom of heaven, the church. Now, the final use of the keys which I believe has to do only with the apostles and something that wasn't passed on uh, to the church today, although Rome would disagree with us on this and they believe that uh, the Pope has this power, but we do not believe any man on earth has this power. It has, it has to do with the power of binding and loosing, which I do not believe necessarily has to do exclusively with whether or not one's sins are forgiven or not forgiven but rather it is the authority to declare what is binding on us in the gospel era and what is not binding on us uh, as far as what 
comes over from the Old Covenant. Now this has to do with the teaching ministry that Jesus gave to the apostles. This idea of binding and loosing was something that was very familiar to the Jew. And they understood that if something was binding, they had to do it. If something was loose, they didn't have to do it. Well, Jesus says, whatever you bind shall have been bound. Whatever you loose shall have been loosed. This has to do, too, with personal teaching or, or what, excuse me, their, what the apostles would teach. Let me just explain. The church is founded on truth. It's founded on God's truth. When Jesus was here on earth, he taught, didn't he? He taught a great number of things. But he didn't teach everything that we needed to know. He left some of that up to his apostles. Uh, let me give you the text that we base that upon in Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. Paul says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the building in whom the whole building, being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Now, what is this holy temple that is being built? Well, it's a temple that's made of living stones. It's a temple built of those who actually are trusting in Jesus Christ, and it's being built in order to offer God praise. It's talking about the church. Now, what is this church founded on? Well, it's founded on Jesus Christ, and it's founded on the apostles and prophets. Now, we do know the work of Christ is the foundation of the church. If Jesus had not done what he did, there would be no church. But in what sense are the, the prophets and the apostles part of that foundation? Did, did they shed their blood for our sins? Did they obey for us? Uh, do they have excess merits that can be transferred to us through the church? No. What's being referred to here is the teaching that Jesus Christ gave through them to complete the New Testament revelation that forms the foundation of the church. Now, I think Paul gives us a clear example of this very thing in his teaching on marriage, and I thought that this was the clearest example because it's the one passage that sometimes we look at. I know I did in the past, and I've seen others do the same. We look at it and we say, what is Paul saying here when he says, I say this and the Lord doesn't say this? Is that, does that mean I don't have to keep it? Does that mean it's just his advice and I don't have to listen to it? Well, no. What it means is that he is speaking of something Jesus did not speak of, but what he is given is still given by the Lord. This is, again, uh, that the, uh, well, the, the idea of, of binding or loosing given to the apostles that binds us to certain behavior. Now, this is what he writes in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 through 13. But to the married, I give instructions. Not I, but the Lord. In other words, this is what Jesus taught. That the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And that the husband should not divorce his wife. But to the rest, I say, not the Lord. In other words, this is, this is continuing revelation I'm giving to you. Jesus didn't speak about this. He's not saying... I don't have the Lord's consent in this, but he's saying this is something Jesus didn't teach on because this was not a situation he addressed. But to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. Now again, Paul is quoting what Jesus clearly taught in the Gospels. But then he adds a situation that Jesus didn't address. Now why? Why would he do that? Why? What was the need? Well, because there was a practice in the Old Testament that was interesting and actually haven't seen it applied too much in the church today, although there are some who may want to, that in the Old Covenant, if, if a Jew, somebody in God's covenant, in his church, were to uh, marry somebody outside the church or outside the covenant or a non-Jew, somebody who didn't actually, um, you know, prosel wasn't proselytized and didn't become a Jew, that they were actually bound to put that person away. As a matter of fact, in, in Ezra 10.3, they were actually commanded to put away their wives and their children because of their, well, because they broke the law of God by marrying them in the first place. 
And because of the ungodly influence they were on their husbands, as a part of their repentance, they had to put them away. But what about the new covenant? Is it the same in the new covenant? No, it, it's different. Paul says, if the unbeliever wants to remain, the believer is not to send him or her away. Now, since that's been given, we are now bound to do that. That's what we have to do. This is the exercise of binding and loosing that Jesus gave to the apostles alone and not to us. Now, the apostles, we need to remember with regard to what they declare, uh, whether a person's sins are forgiven or not, whether they enter into the church or not, and even what they give with regard to teaching, is not something that they do on their own authority. This is on Christ's authority. These things pass down from heaven to us. They didn't just make this decision and then heaven confirms it. They're making their declarations based upon what they believe already to be true in heaven. Now here's where I wanted to draw your attention to that one word that was missing in the Catholic Catechism in the quoting of these verses. And here we have to understand a little bit of, of the tenses you know, the tenses of the verbs, the idea of present, the idea of past, the idea of perfect, and so forth. But the idea that we have in each one of these is this, that whatever action they take on earth, the tense of the verb used for what's going on in heaven is past with regard to their action, which means basically, well, it's reflected in the language here. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. This correctly reflects what the tense of the verb is saying. In other words, when you make this declaration, this is something that already has happened in heaven. You're not making this declaration and then heaven responds by confirming it. You're making this declaration based upon what is already true in heaven. I hope you see that point. When you talk about something that has happened, that's past. Something that has happened and continued, has continuing effects into the present we call that the perfect tense. If we said something that happened in the past and it stopped, we say it had happened, okay? Something, you know, is, is past tense entirely. But if it has happened, that means it took place and it continues into the present. Well, that's exactly what he's saying. Whatever you bind on earth has already been bound in heaven and continues to be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have already been loosed in heaven, you see, has already taken place and will continue. Same thing with regard to Matthew 18, 18, same language is being used. And then in John 20, 23, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven. I want you to notice again the have been. It doesn't say if you forgive someone, then their sins will be forgiven. If you forgive someone, their sins have been forgiven. They're already forgiven. And how do they know they're forgiven? It's on the basis of their profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how they know. I mean, how did Peter know when Simon the sorcerer was uh, wanting to purchase uh, the ability to give the Holy Spirit? How did he know that his sins weren't forgiven when he said, I see that you're still in the bondage of iniquity and, and pray that you won't perish you know, in hell forever? How did he know that? It's because his actions showed that he wasn't a true believer thinking he could buy the Holy Spirit with money. It was the evidence that led him to that conclusion, although some would argue that he had some insight that, that we don't have as being an apostle of the Lord. But again, the basis is, is this. What, what is done on earth according to God's will has already been done or confirmed in heaven. And again, to sum it up this way, heaven doesn't confirm what is done on earth by the church. The church confirms on earth what has been done in heaven. It's the other way around. Well, now we get to the point. What's the point of all this? Why even bother to talk about it? Well, the point is that Jesus did not give his church the authority to forgive sins, as the Roman church believes. The apostles, as you examine their ministry in the word of God, you don't see them forgiving sins. You don't see them doing what Rome seems to think they have the authority to do or what they think Jesus entrusted the apostles. They never do that. But they do declare on the basis of a profession whether or not one's sins are forgiven. They do do that. 
what Jesus' critics said about him when he forgave the sins of the, the, the paralytic. My son, your sins are forgiven you. They said this, who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, God alone is the one who can. They were right in that. Only God can. They didn't recognize that Jesus was God in human flesh. And he had this authority to do this, but only God has the authority to forgive sins. And the way that he does it is through faith in his son. Listen to what Peter said to Cornelius and his household in Acts 10, 43. Of him, of Jesus, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Do you want to receive forgiveness of sins? Are you going to be baptized and then go to the priest, confess your sins and be absolved? Or are you going to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? That's what Peter told Cornelius, that that's what he needed to do. You don't have to go to the church of Rome to be forgiven. You don't need an institution standing between you and the Lord. You don't need access to a priest. Priests can't forgive you. No matter how many times you confess your sins to the priest and they absolve you, forgive you of those things, it, it will do you no good. The only way you can be forgiven is by going directly to Jesus Christ by faith as he is offered to you in the gospel. That is the key. And if you receive Jesus Christ, if you trust in him, if you turn from your sins, the doors of the kingdom of heaven will be opened to you. But if you don't, if you go to the priest instead, and here's where the danger comes in. If you don't go to Jesus Christ, as the Lord tells you, you need to turn from your sins and trust in him. If you go instead through baptism and to, through the priesthood, the doors of the kingdom will be closed against you. You're already on the outside. You're not going to be able to get in unless you go the right way. And that is the danger of this particular teaching, is it does not direct you to go to Jesus Christ. You cannot approach him through baptism and penance. It's not going to work. You have to come to him by faith directly. Trust him and turn from your sins. If that's something you haven't done, then you need to trust Jesus Christ if you are to enter into the kingdom. You need to receive what Jesus Christ has done. Receive the key to his kingdom by turning from your sins and trusting in him. If you do that, the doors of the kingdom of heaven will be opened and you will be saved. But if you try to come in any other way, as we saw this morning, there is no other way. God has provided no other way. It doesn't matter what a church teaches. If it doesn't agree with what God said, you're not going to get in that way. You have to come this way. If you try any other way, the doors of the kingdom are going to stay closed to you. You need to trust Jesus and turn from your sins if you will be saved. And if you haven't done that, then I pray that you will do that now because there is no other way of salvation. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord might take his word and apply it to our lives as we need to have it applied.